and I want to move on to the next bill. And uh, Senator Lombardi, I want you to uh, give an introduction um, after I give my summary. Uh, this bill requires that the Department of Health establish rules and regulations allowing a resident of a nursing home or long-term care facility or a person with decision-making authority for the resident to designate an essential caregiver during the declaration of a disaster emergency. An essential caregiver may be a family member or friend of the nursing home resident and provides physical or emotional support to the resident. As you may have heard, Senator Lombardi, I referenced this bill as we uh, finished up the testimony and had a motion on the last bill. I don't know if you were paying attention at that point. Um, and uh, as I did mention, I have personal experience with this, and I have personal experience from my constituents, uh, some of them who probably talked to you about your legislation. Yeah. Um, and that during the COVID emergency, um, it became very important to try to navigate and figure out a way how to make it safe to have um, a family member or a designee uh, still have uh, safe access to a loved one or a neighbor or uh, in, in the facility. And so if you want to go ahead and further uh, describe the bill before we get to the people who have signed up to call in. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen of the uh, committee. Uh, thank you all for what you're doing, uh, all of my colleagues. I know how hard you're working in these difficult times. Uh, the chairman uh, aptly described what the bill seeks to do, and the chairman, like myself, has gotten uh, a lot of feedback uh, regarding this particular issue during this COVID pandemic. Uh, and in no way is this reflective of a a negative uh, or derogatory statement towards the essential care that the uh, nursing homes and long-term facilities and rehab facilities are uh, doing on a daily basis during these difficult times. Uh, but <clears throat> basically what this bill seeks to do is to reinstate exactly the physical and emotional support for these po uh, folks living in a uh, long-term nursing facility uh, and or assisted living and or long-term uh, facilities. Uh, these folks, uh, I think it's absolutely essential to them uh, that they have this essential caregiver uh, that as it's de designated and defined in the statute, uh, proposed statute, I should say, uh, to, let them, to let them have a positive impact on uh, all of these fragile uh, individuals. The bill essentially defines rather uh, substantially what an essential caregiver is and uh, mandates that the Department of Health establish a set of rules and regulations to allow and to facilitate this designated essential caregiver uh, to enter a facility in person and to provide physical and emotional support uh, for these folks. Um, uh, we've all seen all of the photos of folks in long-term nursing care, uh, you know, there alone uh, with masks on and able to only communicate with their loved ones, caregivers es essentially, uh, through a uh, plate glass window or through FaceTime uh, and not in person, uh, what I think is absolutely essential to the emotional well-being of these folks. Uh, all of you I know have gotten calls on this. Uh, and the Department of Health has also gotten calls on the issue. Uh, essentially, uh, I think that uh, this in-person treatment or in-person uh, contact uh, with these folks provides them with a necessary um, part of their cure and care and even palliative uh, situations that they may face. Uh, it's certainly not intended to uh, substitute for the care they're getting in the nursing homes, but I think it creates a, par a partnership. It co co uh, collaborates the work that's being done inside with uh, folks being able to be there with their loved ones. Uh, uh, I've gotten a plethora of, of written information from uh, medical care providers just to uh, all the way down to loved ones. Uh, and the uh, as judged by the last bill, sometimes uh, these patients and folks, these residents, are not getting the one-to-one -one care that they aptly uh, need. Uh, you know, I think of the anxiety and the loneliness and the deleterious effects it has on their mental well-being, not having someone uh, there with them. And, and I think of, you know, uh, uh, you know, one of my own, 
I, in my own business as a lawyer, I come across a lot of these with guardians not being able to ac access or, or children not having access to their elderly loved ones. Uh, but even when acute situations occur, I, I think of one instance where a gentleman was a victim of a serious accident medically and is now uh, uh, paralyzed from the waist down. And he's been hospitalized and institutionalized in a rehab facility alone since it's happened without any contact, person-to-person uh, -person contact, that is, with any loved ones, including his spouse. So basically, his spouse has never seen him since this happened. And I think that's the poster child for what we're trying to get at here. And I think it's a very important piece of, uh, perhaps the most important piece of legislation that I may bring forth this year. And, and I think it's, uh, it, it's important and imperative that we act in conjunction with the medical providers uh, to allow access to these patients. I thank you for your time. And if there are any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. So I have one question. There is executive order that covers, covers this issue. But the executive order, and you can correct me because you know more about it, it's your bill. The executive order allows facilities to opt out, and therefore we don't have any as of yet that have opted in under the executive order. Is that correct? That's absolutely correct, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. So one of the reparations of your bill versus the executive order is that any fil facility um, based on the DOH re uh, guidelines would, would be required to uh, um, navigate access for the patient. Spot on, Mr. Chairman. The words yeah. speak in terms of mandating that the Rhode Island Department of Health put these rules and regulations in place. Thank you. And one other thing, as I want to give people a heads up, is that uh, we we've been we, you know we've been talking to the Department of Health about this bill and how seriously we take this bill. And I will recommend after we hear from the witnesses that are going to call in on it that we do hold it because we want them to get this right. And so it might take um, another week or two for them to get this right and understand that this legislation does have momentum and to do that work. So I just I want absolutely, to- I understand yeah. that and I appreciate that. And I know there's some technical language right. that the NCLU uh, honed yeah. in on as well. So yeah, I, I fully understand that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Questions for the sponsor from the committee? Thank you. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Have a yeah. good evening. You too. Thank you for waiting. My pleasure. Yeah. Uh, the first person we'll try to connect with over the phone is uh, Elizabeth Peralt. Elizabeth? Yes, hello. Well, thank you for waiting. Uh, go right ahead. Oh, sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, members of the Senate Committee on Health and Human Services. My name is Elizabeth Peralt. I am here today to urge you to take quick and decisive action in helping to get Senate Bill Number 6 approved. With your help, my dad, who currently resides in a dementia unit with early onset Alzheimer's disease, will be able to have a member of our family go into the nursing home on a regular basis to help in his care. I know I am just one of many needing your help today. When the pandemic hit, a shutdown was a must to keep residents safe. Now, after 10 months, the time to allow family back is long overdue. Here's why. Due to my dad's dementia, he cannot communicate his needs and wants. Interaction with us has been minimal at best. The isolation has caused a decline in his health. He has lost weight. He has become increasingly agitated and now needs medication to keep him calm, which he rarely needed before the shutdown. Also, we have learned to, how to keep residents safe through proper use of PPE and testing. I want you to consider that by coming in on a regular basis, we would actually be helping the staff who are already stretched thin due to COVID, as we heard earlier from Senator Goodwin. Dad is completely dependent on others for his physical and emotional care. We would be doing the things the staff would otherwise have to do. We went every single day prior to March 2020. We do not consider going there as a visit. We're not visitors. We are helping to care for his physical and emotional needs. We are his voice 
My mom is responsible for his well-being, just as a parent is to a toddler. Our group of families have been advocating for this since the summer, when numbers were very low. So I would ask you to please consider that it should not matter that the COVID numbers are now high. The number of case positive cases should not be a determining factor in letting us in. COVID is here in Rhode Island. My dad is right now sitting in a COVID unit as we speak, recovering from COVID-19, even with all the safety measures and shutouts in place. Although the staff is wonderful, truly heroes in my mind, dementia residents need a voice. They need love, the one thing this awful disease hasn't taken away from them. Essential means absolutely necessary. I really feel it is absolutely necessary for us to go in and help with their care. I ask you to be swift in your response. This isolation has gone on for too long. Please consider that we can be part of the solution. I ask you, Senators, to help me trust the system my dad taught me to believe in. Please approve this bill to allow us to be a voice for our loved ones. Thank you very much for your time and consideration. Any questions for Elizabeth? I will. I want to. I want to add one more thing. As somebody who's um, personally experienced uh, visiting um, a relative in a nursing home, my mother-in-law, as I talked about earlier, and uh, she was in a nursing home for um, several years before she passed in March. And um, one thing I did witness that I think needs to be honored, um, and it's the motivation for this type of legislation, is that um, there are family members and friends who go out of the way to visit these very lonely people. And then there are those who do not. And so we need to honor the people that make a place in their life and in their day to visit these people and to care for these people in contrast to these people who, who often die alone because they, don't, they either don't have a family member who can or they don't have a family member or a friend who is willing. And to not honor the effort of the people who are making um, a place in their life to visit somebody in a nursing home under normal and or COVID conditions is, um, it would be a mistake for us. And so I think we um, need to put that in the context too of the people who um, not only sponsor or support this kind of legislation, but the people who are calling in who are of those that I have explained that have uh, taken the time out of their life not only to um, talk to us, but to uh, have a place in their day and in their week and in their life for these people that are otherwise alone. Uh, next, we'll try to connect with Charlie Galligan. Charles. Yeah. Go right ahead. Okay. Hi, uh, Senators, Chairman Miller, uh, um, the committee. I appreciate the uh, opportunity to speak, and I greatly appreciate. Uh, you were kind of out a bit, uh, Chairman Miller, but I believe it's your mother-in-law that passed away, and for that I'm very sorry. Yeah. I know far too many people have gone through this. Um, so uh, if you all will do me the uh, courtesy of reading my full statement that I previously submitted to you, I, I, con I trimmed it down uh, for the sake of this hearing, so I'll just read a, a shorter version, but please do read my full version. So my name is Charlie Galligan. I'm a criminal defense investigator from Bristol who has been advocating loudly and relentlessly for improved nursing home visitation since our governor announced plans to reopen casinos and strip clubs in early June. My feisty Bronx mom, Audrey, hit her brain on the slate floor eight years ago, and she's lived with a traumatic brain injury in a nursing home around the corner from me ever since. Simultaneously, my dad, Jack, essentially robbed of his true wife with no notice, he slipped into Alzheimer's disease. He visited my, what my wife calls my new mom, every day until last March, and I was with my mom every night, usually with my saintly wife, Carrie. That was our romantic date night 
three or four nights a week, and I was there seven nights a week. I've learned loads about elder care in the years since my mom's injury through my physical therapist wife and also so immersed in a life full of nurses and CNAs whom we viewed as heroes long before COVID hit. My dad's wife's and my visits with my mom were vital in her recovery and maintenance, giving her and my dad as much safety and happiness that these crummy circumstances would allow. We've always been so incredibly grateful to the staff at my mom's nursing home, and we were happy to lighten their load each night by spending a few hours caring for mom. Notwithstanding her mental limitations after her brain injury, mom was grateful for the daily visits. She would beam with a smile so broadly each time we would come into her room. Our conversations and walks with her every night kept her stimulated. Then came COVID. When the virus hit, I thought it made sense to kick us out of the nursing homes for a while, stay out of the staff's way, not call too often, and just let them do their job during this burgeoning crisis. Alzheimer's prevented Dad of any functional understanding of what the heck was going on, and to this day, I handle his daily complaints about not being able to see my mom anymore as best I can 10 months on. As I've crusaded to get us back in there, I've watched tens of families I know personally lose their loved ones on the inside with no satisfactory way of saying goodbye. It's sheer torture. The governor's essential caregiver plan gave any nursing home the ability to simply opt out of allowing any visitation. And understandably, many facilities are wary of having family members back inside, despite the fact that as of last report, no COVID outbreaks in nursing homes were caused by visitors. But these people, these residents, they're our family, and nursing homes chose to go into the business of caring for the infirmed. COVID is horrible, but there's more to providing care for residents than simply avoiding COVID. Human beings need an occasional hug. They need their hands held, especially on their way out. We need some language in this bill, like the, the version the General Assembly had in, in, the, in 2020 that never got heard. It insisted on bedside companionship and regular and sustained physical access to the residents. In short, decency, dignity, and compassion. And though my dad may only be able to hold my mom's hand at this point, as their conversational capabilities have dwindled significantly since their separation and continued decline, we, I need this bill to allow me to get him back in to do that, to hold her hand, to hug her just before the first one kicks. It would be inhumane not to allow us that dignity. I'll tell you that the most conscientious and good-hearted CNAs and nurses I know from the inside have urged me to continue fighting as they see the need to bring families back in, and they welcome our easing their burden by caring for our own moms, husbands, wives on a daily basis. Sadly, these same staff members have simultaneously warned me that some in the industry have grown too comfortable without the prying eyes and ears of families inside and would prefer to leave it that way. That is certainly not consistent with the patient-centered care which so many nursing homes boast. And please know, I want your committee to know that for every one of us who chose to submit our thoughts to, to you, and I know you've got a lot of written statements and I think three of us are speaking up, there are a thousand or two around the state who are living the same misery but do not feel comfortable speaking up. Rhode Island nursing home residents are dying daily, usually alone. Could you please, please fast-track this bill to show some mercy to those who are, who are still hanging on by a thread? Thank you. Um, I want everybody to know that Charlie's the kind of advocate that uh, every worthy bill but, needs. Um, he's been... Uh, he's but been simply putting residents in lifelong solitary confinement okay. is a solution whose day has long passed. And I welcome you guys to rebut or ask me any questions. Okay, I thought you I thought you were done, Charlie. Um, no, there's there's glitches, but okay. um, I have a, um, I have more to say. But I'd welcome any any comments or questions you guys have. I was just starting off with my comment that um, any any good piece of legislation, we're we're lucky to have you as an advocate, and I hope any good piece of legislation. Um, has somebody like Mr. Galligan uh, advocating for it. He's been great, a uh, great advocate on this legislation. 
Thank you. Um, yeah. I will just want to add a couple things, Senators. Um, you know, we've all learned loads in the past 10 months, and I just I do find it a little funny that, <clears throat> you know, somehow the scientists were able to research when this <laughs> crisis hit, they were able to research, develop, and distribute vaccine in about eight months, and we haven't been able to develop a decent visitation plan in nursing homes. To me, that's absurd. I just think we've got to get smarter, more creative, and just work more quickly. The, uh, this bill, you know, it costs no money, and uh, we need better language, as I, as I stated in my statement. Um, and I'll end with, you know, I, I've gotten a lot of um, documentation, and I'll end with one, uh, one submission I received about, about the isolation in nursing homes. It says, I want you to listen to this closely, and then I'll tell you who wrote it. It says, strategies are needed to combat the unintended consequences of prolonged separation and to maintain overall health and well-being of the residents. The crisis has exacerbated the challenges of social isolation and loneliness in the nursing, home, in the nursing homes. Feelings of loneliness can have deleterious consequences, including increased risk of depression, suicidal thoughts, aggressive behaviors, and anxiety. Very well said. Who wrote that? The Department of Health wrote that in their edict in December 14th for their version of, a, of an essential caregiver program. So that's how they feel, but yet they didn't put any teeth in that, and they allowed any nursing home to just opt out. How can they feel that strongly about that and then just not actually let us get in there? If you guys can be decent enough to fast track this bill, I'm a little concerned when, Senator Miller, you just said you were going to take it back to the DOH. I, I, obviously, the language needs tinkering with, but they haven't shown a competency to move quickly on this. If you could please fast track it, I'll do my best to bubble wrap my dad here at the house and keep him upright because he is beginning to fall so that we can wait you guys out and get him back in there to hug my mom. Thanks a bunch for listening. And please, if you have any questions or doubts or whatever, or complaints, fire away. Any questions for Mr. Galligan? Thank you. Um, I think Senator Lombardi can corroborate that uh, when I said we need to go back to the Department of Health, we're going to uh, commit that we work aggressively on this. I, I don't think Mr. Galligan has to worry about that between Lombardi and Miller. Um, Without a doubt, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> So uh, we have one other person who signed up to uh, call in on this bill. It's uh, Ronnie Ferraro. Hello? Ronnie, go right ahead. Yes, hi. Thank you for hearing my testimony, Chairman. Uh, my name is Ronnie Ferraro. I'm testifying in favor of Senate Bill 6, the Essential Caregiver Program. Um, I have no affiliation with any organization. I'm an essential caregiver for my husband. We've been on a journey that began 12 years ago when he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease at the young age of 62 and living the past seven years in dementia units. And um, I've listened to the, all the testimony, even from the bill before, so I just want to add a couple of things. I did submit uh, something uh, in writing before, but I just want to say a couple of other things. Um, I just want people to imagine what it's like walking in our shoes being an essential family caregiver with your loved one that's been diagnosed, and this is my husband, with a devastating disease such as Alzheimer's and now living in a dementia unit. Um, we've journeyed with our loved ones throughout this disease process, being their advocate, contributing to their care despite them living in a nursing home. And through love and regular on-site support, our actions have made a visible difference in our loved one's quality of life. And while life with our loved one after such a diagnosis changes forever, the commitment we make as essential caregivers to our loved ones never changes. And if anything, it has grown stronger. And then the unimaginable hit this year, and we are literally locked out of our loved one's life due to pandemic precautions. And the on-site care and support we gave to them is now not allowed. Communication is extremely difficult due not only to our loved one's disease, but also the overwhelming challenges faced by the facilities and staff, which I know we heard significant testimony about this in the last bill. Months go by before we were allowed a 30-minute appointment 
to see our loved one at a significant distance only. You observe the toll of that absence has taken on them, and that's only the part you can see from afar, if you can even see it at all. So just imagine that distress. Now, months ago, we, there was a group of uh, states that introduced a compassionate program, an essential caregiver program, that would, um, based on our involvement prior to our loved ones, um, prior to the pandemic, we would qualify because we were involved significantly before in their care, not just visitors. Um, so we would be able to follow established guidelines if we lived in these other states. We would get weekly virus testing, as an example, infection control training, wear the protective gear. We would do everything that the staff is doing um, when they go into work at a facility. We would now be able to contribute again to our loved one's care and quality of life, even if it was only for a few hours a day. Imagine if we lived in one of those states, and now Senate Bill Number 6 can make it a reality for us in Rhode Island. And sadly, as Charlie said, time is of the essence. Why? On January 4th, my husband and the other residents in his dementia unit received their first vaccine, and oh my God, we had so much hope. We had that first glimmer of hope we haven't had in over 10 months. Sadly, on January 6th, we received heartache. Six of them tested positive for the virus in his unit. Over the, over the following week, another eight tested positive and so on. So we've lost over 10 months of time with our loved ones as the facility wanted to keep the virus out by keeping families out. We were denied access to our loved ones, and the virus came anyway, and two days after the vaccine. So what was accomplished in the last 10 months of this lockout? Heartache, loneliness, frustration, depression, and accelerated decline in their conditions due to the absence of family caregiver involvement and oversight. On the evening of March 12th, 2020, when I gave my husband a hug and a kiss for the last time that I was with him, my parting words, as always, were, I'll be back. Please help me keep my promise before it's too late. Please pass this bill. Thank you for your consideration. Any questions for Ronnie? Yes. From the committee? No. I want to thank you, Ronnie, for your testimony. And um, as we consider this and negotiate it with the Department of Health, I, I want you to know that um, one of the things that uh, this testimony has made us think about is not only a vaccination protocol that could be part of it, but also um, that when we've heard from nursing homes and facilities about how difficult it might be to operate um, under such legislation, the uh, point I tried to make is an important point that you're not going to, if a facility has 125 patients, as an example, we heard of, from a facility that size, unfortunately, you're not going to be accommodating 125 loved ones. And so this is not a burden based on um, that level of uh, effort that the nursing home would have to go on. I wish it was, but it isn't. And so those who have that commitment, um, should be honored with a protocol that the Department of Health and the bill sponsor can come up with. And, uh, and I'd like to just, oh, I'm sorry. No, go I, right ahead. Am I, still, I just wanted to, to you know, uh, to tag on to what you're saying. Uh, this would not be, this is distinguished from a visiting program. This is not visitation. Be, because those of us uh, involved family members would, would not just do a visit and have a nice tea and, you know, stay for an hour and then leave. These were involved and are involved family members that actually contributed to the care um, and supplemented the care because of all the um, difficulties from the other bill that were testified. That, you know, you heard some wonderful testimony um, on, the, on the other side. And I know this is a bigger issue that needs to be solved on that whole, the whole financial piece and uh, to get more help and standard, better standards for, for care. Yeah, um, part of, but part of families what, are, are, yeah. are, are, you know, significant in that equation. Yeah, part of what uh, the Department of Health wants to work on is what uh, level of care would be safe for uh, a loved one or, or a relative to give to a patient under the, under, 
under the care within the care of a facility so that's part of the complexity of the legislation that we're going to have to work on so okay well any any help that any of us can give in this effort yeah. we're, we're, please use us because we're very yeah. experienced in um, what what we did with our loved ones before this um, terrible uh, pandemic came came to us thank you thank you um, if there's no further testimony, which I believe there is there. not, um, a motion to hold this bill for further study? Mr. Chairman, I move to hold the Senate Bill 6 for further study. Yeah. Is there a second for that? I'll second it. Uh, the clerk? Senator Bell? Uh, I... Senator Culkin. Aye. Senator DeMario. Aye. Senator Golden. Aye. Senator Lawson. Aye. Chairman Miller. Aye. Vice Chair Valverde. Aye. 